First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional elders of this land, and not only to acknowledge them, to, but also to pay my respects and to offer my warm, warm affection for the people who have been very good to me in the 55 years that I've been in Australia. And on this 50th anniversary of the Monash Indigenous Centre, I think it's appropriate for me to do a kind of guideline to what has happened, in my view, over the last 50 years. So I'm going to take you on a kind of 15-point voyage, and we'll see what you make of it at the end of it. Uh, in 1896, when investigating ways of stopping the physical killing, the genocide, the kidnapping of children and women in North Queensland in particular, Queensland colonial government appointed a man called Archibald Meston. And in 1896, he did a very quick report. It only took him six months to do it. And he said the genocide has got to stop. And he said the only way to, address, to arrest their destruction, to save any part of the race from extinction, is to abolish the native police force, which was a maniacally and homicidal unit of the police, mainly white officers and black staff, ban opium, which he called this detestable drug, and to ensure the absolute isolation of Aborigines from the white race, he says, who, coloured by prejudice and distorted by ignorance, commit shameful deeds. And the answer, according to Meston, was absolute isolation totally restrict them, keep them at a distance from the people who, in no particular order, wanted to kill them or take their women or sell them opium, which was the big drug deal of the day. And he said, restrict them, but for a lot longer than the Italian word quarantine suggests. The word is derived from that word, 40 days of isolation. It's going to be a lot longer than 40 days. And when they discovered that legal fences to provide some kind of cocoon around Aborigines wasn't enough, they resorted to geographic fences. And when you look at the geographic fences, Aborigines were not native to a whole host of places called Mapoon and Arakoon and Mornington Island and so on. They were taken there. And they were placed there by missionaries whose sole criterion of choosing those remote places were, was that they were, quote, splendidly secluded and splendidly secluded they were in the most inaccessible parts of Australia because that's what it took to keep them apart from the men and the women who committed shameful deeds. Now, it's 12, 12 decades later, and how far have we come since then? So let's have a look at some of the factors apart from the usual statistical social indicators and all those horrible at-risk factors that they use in closing the GAP programs and devise our own checklist, in a sense. How are Aborigines and Islanders now as a people? How are they treated generally as individual communities and as individuals? How are they perceived? How do they feel in terms of confidence, security, dignity and belonging? Some of these questions I can't answer. I'm not Aboriginal. I don't know what it feels, but I think I know what it can feel like. So we need some specific questions to ask about how they fared. How have they fared demographically? Well, there's been an enormous change. It's estimated that there were 750,000 Aborigines at the time of first settlement. We look at a 1911 census figure, it's down to 31,000. The latest census figure talks about 600 odd thousand, which makes Aborigines and Ireland as something like 2.4, 2.5% of the population, which is not huge. But despite all that doomed race theory stuff that we're all familiar with, Aborigines and Ireland have proven to be enormously successful survivors. And they've survived immense obstacles. The genocide, the physical killing, the kidnapping, the so-called, if you want to call it that, ethnic cleansing, the removal from one part of the country to the other, 
the relocation from places in our lifetime, certainly mine, Mapoon, Terry High High, Maralinga, there's a whole host of places and milestones where Aborigines have been moved from or moved to. And they've also survived that appalling, appalling bound volumes of legislation which tried to demarcate who was a quarter and who was an eighth and who was a sixteenth and who was a half and who was a three-quarter and how rights were apportioned according to those fractions of arithmetical colour that they represented. How have they fared geographically? Interesting, when I started work here at Monash, or before that at the ANU in 1961, the majority of the Aboriginal and Islander populations were remote. And there's been an absolutely cosmic change in the geographic landscape that the communities are no longer altogether remote, remote, or just plain remote, or rural, semi-rural, peri-urban, urban. Today, something like 72% of the Aboriginal population is, in fact, urban. So they've moved from mist and strict isolation and quarantine to almost a position of, if you like, physical integration in the community. Okay. The problem is that even though there is this physical integration and physical proximity of Aborigines to non-Aborigines, they remain quarantined in the white mind. They're still people who are segregated enough in the political and bureaucratic minds, still removed enough from society to impose restrictions on wages, on incomes, on income access, on food access, on alcohol access, and to being subject to special, I think they call them mutual responsibility agreements, by which people in remote areas like Balgo get a petrol bowser if the kids can show that they brush their teeth. Or you can play sport if you come to school, but if you don't come to school, then you can't play sport. In short, even though there is this geographic proximity there is a very real problem that a lot of Aboriginal individuals and communities are still separated from the mainstream society and the services that are provided by mainstream society. How have they fared legally? There's been a big change from being non-citizens, although subject to the British Crown, to have evolved into having some legal pluses, and those pluses have come from native, native Title Acts and from various land rights statutes. But being legal, legal, legally equal, also means having the right to have access to adequate criminal representation in court and to having adequate representation in the pursuit and what Charles Rowley used to call the recovery of their civil rights in civil courts. There's a long way to go on that. Aboriginal legal services have done a sterling job for the most part, but they're underfunded, they're under-resourced, they're often resourced by very junior staff with very, very little experience. And you don't have to go to law school for five years to stand up constantly and plead guilty. My client is a choir boy and his mother needs him and uh, please give him a bond. That's not, to me, legal representation. What has also improved enormously is the growth of Aboriginal incorporations and associations. Many years ago, actually beginning in the 1970s, the late Charles Rowley and I recommended that Aborigines needed a cocoon. They needed some kind of carapace, like a tortoise or a turtle, to protect them because they were always the naked individuals versus the corporate men in the prison service, in the police service and so on. And we thought that the best way to go was to incorporate their rights in a legal association so that they could speak with a much more <clears throat> powerful voice when they were confronted by the institutions of white society. And that happened with a vengeance. I don't know, today there are about 10, 15, 20,000 Aboriginal and corporations and associations around Australia, but it's produced a legal wrinkle. And the legal wrinkle is that Aborigines no longer appear as individuals when they want to deal with government, when they need to deal with anybody, 
They always have to do it through the corporation, and the corporation's rights have become greater than the individuals who comprise the corporation. Okay. Is legal equality enough? In the last three months, we've witnessed a team of eight SWAT cops arrive in Moree to remove five children from a household. We've seen a 22-year-old woman in Port Hedland die in custody because she was there for not paying a parking fine. These are the sorts of things that, I'm sorry, do not happen in the non-Aboriginal community. The institutionalization of Aboriginal youth disfigures, distorts, mars our Australian human rights landscape in a most horrific way. I refuse to concede that there has been such an incredible change in the 50 years since I started looking at some of these things. When Aborigines in general, in the Northern Territory, in Queensland in particular, where I worked, where they were the most law-abiding segment of the community, even though they could commit crimes that only they could commit, like drink liquor, have access to alcohol and so on, and they have now become, according to the statistics, the most criminal community on this planet. Now, something is amiss. The question is, we can ask later, what has happened in between? Why? How have they fared politically? They achieved federal voting rights in 1962, but that didn't stop West Australian Liberals from trying to disfranchise them at West Australian elections in 1978. And since then, yes, you can say to me, why are you so negative? There are positives, there are parliamentary representatives, there are cabinet ministers, there are leaders of political parties, there are deputy leaders of the opposition, there's presidencies of the Labour Party and so on and so forth. Okay, and now we are faced with yet a question that's been raised, I don't know, about a hundred times since I've been in Australia. Let's have four separate MPs for Aborigines in the manner of the Maori in New Zealand, etc., so they can have special representation. We now have a Prime Minister who's talking about putting Aborigines into the Constitution, but only in 2017 on the anniversary of what was supposedly a New Deal, but was nothing of the sort in 1967 referendum. Why in the Constitution? Well, they won't really be in the Constitution. They'll be in the preamble of the Constitution in a symbolic way and being listed as First Nation peoples. Very important step, symbolically, but that's all it is, symbolically. The only thing I can urge Aboriginal friends to do is what friends in New Zealand and Canada have done, and if they play their cards right, they can use that First Nation status to win a number of political and moral battles which they won't be able to win legally. United States has just given $500 million to the Navajo people for the mismanagement of their lands. Canada and New Zealand have made enormous financial and land reapportionment settlements on their native peoples. We're still waiting. And one can recall that famous February 2008 speech by Kevin Rudd where the nation stopped to listen to that dramatic speech, but there was a little wrinkle at the end of that speech, a little PS which got tucked away. There won't be any reparations because we can spend the money much better somewhere else. Okay. <sighs> Economically, within my working lifetime, Aborigines have experienced a great change from working for rations only, to working for wages and a pocket money portion, to working for wages that were below the basic wage, that were prescribed in law, allowed a dollar a week pocket money, and the rest of their money placed in trust, allegedly to take care of their welfare and care, but which monies mysteriously disappeared and the records of which mis mysteriously disappeared in a number of fires from time to time. <coughs> Even though things have changed remarkably on a number of contexts, Aborigines remain the most under-income segment of our population. 
We heard about a month ago that one in seven Australians lives below the poverty line, and I can recall having fierce arguments here. Louis Waller and others will remember him in the 60s. Ronald Henderson did a major study of poverty in Australia, and I would argue with him, and I think successfully, that there were two levels of poverty in Australia. There was Australian poverty and there was Aboriginal poverty, and the two were not the same thing. One of the saddest things to watch when I'm talking about quarantine is that social welfare money, which ostensibly or theoretically Aborigines were entitled to from 1959 onwards, there's only been a very brief period in which those benefits were paid directly to people. Otherwise, they are quarantined in a variety of ways, paid to institutions on their behalf. And now in the Northern Territory, we found those payments quarantined in return for vouchers, for food, etc., etc. And there has been literally only a very brief moment, perhaps two or three years in the history of modern Aboriginal Australia, in which they've enjoyed their social welfare benefits directly. So poverty in the income sense is still a major hallmark of our society. On the health side, what can I say? 50 years ago, I arrived in the Northern Territory, tuberculosis, malaria, bacillary dysentery, leprosy, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, infantile diarrhea, gastroenteritis. These were the illnesses of the time. And things have changed markedly on that front, except it's been replaced by strokes and heart disease and obesity and gross diabetes and renal disease. You name it, they have it. And the numbers who die from those diseases are infinitely greater in volume and number than the people who died from those disease patterns of 50 years ago. Infant mortality, yeah, it's improved markedly. It's about a fifth of what it was when I first came onto the scene. Infant mortality is measured on the number of children who survive between naught and one. Nobody looks at what happens between one and eight. And I don't know if any of you remember poor old Archie Calacarinos. Some of you do. <laughs> Wayne, you, yeah. Archie Calacarinos was a riven, striven, ravaged country doctor who wrote a book called Every Second Child, and what he said was, every second child in Kuna Barabran dies before the age of five. Everybody thought that Archie was off his trolley. He had a vitamin C crusade. But when I went to Kuna Barabran and I looked at the cemetery in Kuna Barabran, the truth is, every second child dies before the age of five. Okay. Um, Life expectation, everybody goes berserk about the numbers, the statistics we get from the closing the gap, and it's now said to be an 11-year gap between male life expectation of Aborigines and non-Aborigines. And the gap says the ABS is 11 years, which means that most Aboriginal men would be living to 68, 69, 70. It's not true, they don't. And the gap is more likely 30 years. And you don't have to believe me, just, and you don't have to, and you shouldn't believe the ABS statistics. Just go to cemeteries and have a look at the headstones and see how old the people are when they're dead. And they're not living to 68 and 69 and 70. Okay, residentially, how have they done? Look, I don't want to spend too much time on the vexed question of Aboriginal housing. It has always been a major problem. It always will be a major problem. Why? Paul Hasluck says in 1951, when he announces the assimilation policy, Aborigines should live, quote, after the normal Australian manner, whatever that means. But three-bedroom cream brick veneer homes are not for Aboriginal people. They're not a nuclear family of a married couple and 2.2 children. Their housing needs and family sizes just don't basically fit with our notion of what a nuclear family house design should be. And scheme after scheme after scheme has been tried year in and year out, some new architecture school, some new program, building new Aboriginal housing, etc., etc., etc. And the answer is nobody has really, except for a guy called Wally Dobkins in the Northern Territory once, he was an interesting Zambian, 
have really tried to consult seriously with Aboriginal people what it is that is needed in terms of housing. We now have a report from Rachel Irving about the conditions and housing of people in Kununurra. The Aboriginal people of Kununurra don't want houses that are designed in Perth because the Perthians have no idea what it's like to live in Kununurra. Nobody has an idea of what it's like to live in Kununurra. Believe me, it is the end of the world. Uh, she's now produced a report on something new in housing, and that is homeless Aboriginal kids. In my lifetime, one never saw Aboriginal homeless kids because they were always taken in by really somewhere. There are now Aboriginal kids out on the streets who are not being taken in by anybody. Educationally, fantastic changes. On these very premises, in 1969, the late Sid Dunn, who was Professor of Education, and I ran a national seminar. And one of the papers, which I think I gave, said, amazing, we've broken through. There are nine Aborigines at university in 1969. Hey, that's 40-odd something years ago. Today, there's something like 30,000 Aboriginal and Islander people have been to TAFE or to some kind of tertiary institution which is great. We have dozens and dozens of programs, private school after private school, at least in Sydney, I'm sure it's the same in Melbourne, Riverview, Ignatius and John, Scotch, all of them, Cranbrook, they're all running programs for Aboriginal. I, I addressed the Riverview kids last year sometime, or maybe it was two years ago, and I was asked to talk to a special class of boarding school kids at St Ignatius, the school of Tony Abbott. And there were 38 students in that one class, yeah? All great stuff. Okay. There are now doctors, there are dozens of lawyers, there is an eye specialist, and so the list of, of achievement goes on. But if you look at the Northern Territory, you look at North Queensland, at the general mean reading and writing ability of the average of Aboriginal and Islander kid, way, way below the norm. What about role models? Yeah, in my time, there have been some great role models. Charlie Perkins, Margaret Valadian, Colin Burke, Eleanor Burke, the Atkinson family, Bruce McGuinness, Gary Foley, Marcia Langton, Larissa Berendt, Noel, Noel Pearson. They're all there as role models. But in the end, when Buddy Franklin can earn $10 million over 10 years, why in hell's name do you want to go to school for 12 or 15 years and wind up getting a job as a tour guide or a forest ranger for 40 or 50,000 bucks, or even an academic for $130,000? I think that's what they get, Lynette. I don't know what you get. Um, when you can get 10 million, when Jonathan Thurston can be earning a million dollars a season playing rugby league, when they can pit their bodies with against their opponents without having to go through all this educational hoo-ha. So I'm sorry to say it, sporting fan that I am, the sports model is still a greater model than the educational model. Culturally, yeah, fantastic. Aboriginal culture has truly arrived. And if you don't believe me, look at the pictures from the G20 last weekend. And with ev every single backdrop, Putin, Modi, whoever it was, Aboriginal paintings in the background, swarming all over the place, suffusing the place, overwhelming the place. It's wonderful. It's lovely. Aboriginal culture is here to stay. Eisteddfords, dance theatres, artistic companies, plays, music, art, literature. It's, it's just wonderful to see the absolute explosion of Aboriginal culture, almost to the point where you wouldn't know that we had an Aboriginal culture. I mean, a, a non-Aboriginal culture. Okay. It's come a very long way from the days when, Sandra will remind, remember this only too well, I go into the welfare branch office in Alice Springs to buy a watercolour painting by Keith Namajira, and the typist on the veranda says to me, what's this? And I said, I need you to stamp the painting because you couldn't buy a paint painting without it being stamped by a welfare branch officer. And she says, can I see the painting? And she says, hmm, it's a small one, $10. And I said, what's a big one? She says, $15.
And the back of my Keith Namajira painting says, officially signed and stamped by Harry Leditsky, welfare officer, price $10. Uh, things have come an enormously long distance to murals in Paris and on the rooftops of the Louvre and all the rest of it. Okay. Aboriginal art and culture has been appropriated and taken over, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, really. It's exploited, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Socially, how have they fared? A very important question. Suicide is a social issue. It's not a medical one. It's not a psychiatric one. It's not a health one. It's a social problem with socio environmental causes. It's not to be, the answer is not to be found in the depression basket. There are explanations for it and I've been working on this for years and I continue to work on it while I run short of breath. Aboriginal suicide is amongst the highest on the planet and the rates in the Northern Territory are about 12 times higher than the national norm and about 17 times higher in the Kimberleys. There's got to be an explanation for this. It's got to be addressed. It's the social indicator, in a sense, to end all indicators. And this has only been since 1960. And a lot of people don't believe me when I say there was no Aboriginal suicide before 1960. Believe me, my friends, I've scoured every police record, every magistrate's record, every court record, every anthropology record, every missionary record. There was the occasional self-harm, but suicide, as we know it, was not in the Aboriginal, Aboriginal vocabulary. And Eve Fessel here and others will tell, will tell you there is absolutely no word in any Aboriginal language or dialect for suicide, nor is it depicted in paintings in, our, in, in artistic works. Why, with all due respect to the great man they buried last week, Gough Whitlam, he arrives in 1972, he suddenly says the Aboriginal communities have got to have autonomy. They say, here's a budget, you're on your own, autonomy, we want to see the spreadsheet bookkeeping at the end of the year. There isn't electricity, for God's sake, let alone a computer, let alone somebody literate in English or in modern accounting arithmetic, and everything begins to implode. And what happens is that the structures, as bad as they were, and I'm not suggesting for a minute we go back there, the draconian structures that were there in, throughout the beginning of the 20th century and are suddenly <coughs> removed overnight cause communities that were ordered communities to implode and they become disordered communities. Okay. The racial abuse socially is still there. And the racial abuse is to be found in many quarters of Australia, not just on the football field, but hardly on what we might call a Barry Spur of the moment. You find it from an English poetry professor at Sydney University, and you find it in a sense propped up or an attempt to prop it up by no less a person than our current Attorney General, who nearly got away with doing away with the fragile protections that we've got in the, anti -discri the Racial Discrimination Act when he argued that Australians have a right to get up in the morning and be bigoted. Popularly, popul popularly, how have Aborigines fared? Well, some good things have happened. All those dreadful cartoons we used to see from the Bulletin magazine and Smith's Weekly depicting sort of destitute, fly-blown, unhuman stick figures wandering around in the desert somewhere. They've all gone. But we still have problems. We have the problems of people still talking about real Aborigines as opposed to Andrew Bolt Aborigines. You know, you, and we, we still have this kind of strange hang-up of wanting ah, the noble savage the head banded spear, one leg, standing one leg, looking out in the eternal dream time. This is the romantic picture we still like to hold on to, but it is no longer the picture, if ever it was. Today, when you look at Aborigines in popular culture, you can't watch your television set without seeing an ad for an Aboriginal netball player or basketball player or 
Aussie rules footballer, rugby league player, rugby union player, and now we have 13 to 15 percent of all players in AFL and rugby league are Aboriginal or Islander, which is a remarkable percentage or over-representation. Okay. All this is great at one level, but what does this do for remote communities or the rural communities? Is there sporting equality? Is there access to fields, lights, grass, ovals, pitches, change rooms, physiotherapists, trainers, coaches? No, not at all. So we still have great parts of Australia. I once described them as looking like Afghanistan in wartime or Somalia in drought time when you look at the sporting facilities in rural communities. I'm nearly there. I have an issue, and Colin inadvertently or advertently related to this about the changes of name, the nomenclatural problem. Aborigines are unique in Western society, the society in which native peoples were colonised in Western, Western countries, of never having been allowed to call themselves by the name by which they wish to be called by. So they were Aborigines from day one. And along came the 50s and 60s and 70s and an enormous battle, Wayne, you'll remember this, Kuri, Nunga, Yulnu, Murray, whatever. And this lasts for 20 years, and suddenly the cute and chic vocabulary overtakes it, and everybody is indigenous. And what is this, I don't like the word, you may like it, I don't, indigeneity, what does it mean? What it does is it obliterates the history of diverse Aboriginal communities, absolutely obliterates that history, the enormous historical, geographic, and legal differences that there were between them. It doesn't distinguish between Torres Strait Islanders and Aborigines. It doesn't distinguish between South Sea Islanders and Aborigines. And everything gets suffused under the word indigenous, even with a capital I. There's an Aboriginal flag, which is great, but where's the TI flag, which is an official flag recognised by the Queensland and the Federal Government? Where's the South? Has anybody ever seen a South Sea Island flag? But in 2002, it was legislated to be an official flag to be flown on ceremonial occasion. You never see it. So this diffusion, this suffusing of everybody as if they had the same history, the same legacies, the same current and contemporary problems, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't hold with it. Okay, I did see one nice thing last week. New South Wales is opening a system of courts involving magistrates and elders to try and deal with juveniles so that they can avoid the prison and juvenile justice system. They're going to be called Curry Courts. Wonderful. There's only one problem I have with that. I came back from a visit to New Zealand to recommend that system because it was operating in New Zealand, but the date, <laughs> 1966, so we're kind of slow learners. Academically, the change has been fantastic. I came to this country in January 1961 and all I could read was about Aboriginal haemoglobins and haptoglobins and their dental plaque in the Western Desert and their mortuary and circumcision rites and they were objects of scientific curiosity. And now we have a situation I saw last week when ARC grants Mick Dodson has been given half a million dollars, which is fantastic to look at the very things that I'm looking at, if you like, for free, yeah, the negativity about Aborigine. So the wheels come full circle, yeah. Mick Dodson is the professor, I'm not. The other great thing is not only has the, uh, the, uh, the menu changed, especially through the Monash Indigenous Centre and the leaps and bounds that have been made in a place like this, but the fact that Aborigines are co-venturers in the research and academic enterprise and there are now many projects that are solely Aboriginal or conceived and run, which is really a remarkable thing. Okay. I came here in 1964 and my outrage knew low, no limits because the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies, which began in May 1964, had a mandate to look 
only at, quote, the disappearing aspects of Aboriginal life before it is too late. And anthropology was defined as the science which would lead the pathway to that recapturing of Aboriginal life before it is too late. So I came to this university and I said to a bunch of very well-disposed medical and science professors, could we start a centre that would look at anything but the disappearing aspects of Aboriginal life and look at the contemporary situation. And when I came here today in a taxi, I was literally mind boggled because we're looking for the Menzies building, which is the only building I remember. And the first building we come to, big building, dedicated building, is Monash Indigenous Centre. I, I, wow, you, you just have to take my word for it. What a tremendous wow that is in the space of 50 years. And that 50 years ago was me, Sue Stevenson, sitting here in the front row. She wasn't even 16, so you can work out her age now. She's still serving at Monash now. I think she's the longest serving member of Monash staff. The late Elizabeth Eggleston, the late Lorna Lipman. And look what it is today with Lynette and all the others and Colin and others before them and Eve. Okay. Historically, nearly finished. How have Aborigines travelled historically? Aboriginal history in this country doesn't begin, but for white people it begins in 1975. The first books on Aboriginal history are actually published in 1975. I published a book in 1972 or 73, I think it was, called Black Viewpoints, which was a series of lectures of Aborigines speaking on their own behalf. Kevin Gilbert did a book called, called Because the White Man Will Never Do It, etc. And all the historians, Lyndall Ryan appears and Henry Reynolds appears and all of these people, but Aboriginal history as it is conceived of in white society is literally only 25, 39 years old. That's, that's very, very young. The History Journal only began in the 1980s, I think, Lynette, Aboriginal History as a journal. So Aboriginal history is young, but it's there now in the syllabus, despite the Spur Professor, despite the John Howard's, despite the Christopher Pines, despite the attempted interference with the national curriculum, Aboriginal history is here to stay. Now, I've written lots of books and lots of articles expressing my pessimism in Aboriginal affairs. And for an old man of 80, I've travelled from my terrible pessimism as a 29-year-old here to an octogenarian who is halfway towards something called optimistic pessimism or pessimistic optimism. And I always end these sorts of things with a thought, if I were Aboriginal, would I rather have been young then or young now? It's a difficult question with all the suicide and all these other disease patterns and things that are going on. But the answer is in terms of freedom, in terms of human rights, in terms of dignity, I'd rather be a young Aboriginal now than then. Thank you. No, it's, it's not okay, it's not okay, but it's on the map. It's out there in the marketplace, both in the Aboriginal marketplace, in the sensible non-Aboriginal marketplace, and of course they're always the exploiters, they're always the vultures, they're always the scavengers who are going to make a quick buck or who are going to do dreadful things. I mean, the history of exploitation of Aboriginal art, which I think a book just been published recently by, I've forgotten the man's name, but it's the inside story of Aboriginal art theft and so on and so forth. It's not a pretty story. And I can remember guy after guy coming up from down south to Yerkala and to Elko Island and places like this and offering tins of tobacco for paintings that wound up in uh, Qantas House in Tokyo and so on and so forth. Um, there is a stronger and stronger Aboriginal movement to 
begin to ask for their share of the goodies for, for this. Um, you can't really stop cultural exploitation. You know, it's, you go to the United States, you go to Canada, you go to Commonwealth Games in Canada, and what do you see? You see uh, Haida totem poles, and you see Micmac Indian motifs, and you see Inuit uh, imagery, and so on and so forth. It seems to be that Western society doesn't have enough belief in its, old, in, in its own cultural artistic heritage, but turns to the native one as if to say, this is us, this is Canada, this is New Zealand, this is, this is Australia. Can we stop it? No, I don't think so. But it's certainly healthier than the other way. And the other way, by the way, was I, my first visit to Elko Island. Um, Molly, I think, Delemos, you went to Elko Island. Yeah. Elko Island, the Reverend Shepherdson. No, Aborigines are not, allowed, are not allowed to engage in any artwork. Why? He says, says the Methodist Reverend, it'll strengthen their culture. So he banished it. The reference to the incarceration and imprisonment rates is not something new. It's part, in a sense, of a colonial ethos. And that colonial ethos in Australia is stronger than in most other settled countries like Canada and, and uh, South Africa or whatever, is that assimilation is still the major river that runs through Australia. And assimilation, the real meaning of assimilation, we go back to the real colonial days of Portugal, Spain, England, Belgium, France, Spain, even Italy. You devise policies in the metropolis and you export them to the colonies and it is up to the colonised to conform and to accommodate to what Lisbon and Madrid have ordered. And they have to bend to your will. Now, there were some much bigger accommodations done in the colonies in Africa than ever we made in Australia. We didn't want to accommodate to anything Aboriginal. They had to accommodate to our way of doing things. Now, even though Hasluck, with his assimilation, he used the very word, the assimilation policy, was to allow for a certain degree of biculturalism and respect for Aboriginal traditions and so on, there is still the unbending river that crushes forward. You guys have got to become like us if you want to go anywhere. Now, there was, for a short period, quite a decent bilingual, bicultural program in the, in the Northern Territory. It's gone. Who teaches bicultural, bi, bi, uh, uh, bilingual education anymore? Even in my day, mo there were about three missionaries who spoke a native language. Uh, certainly the Aranta people at Hermansburg and uh, Beulah Lowe with the Methodists and so on, but they were rarities. There were over 450 officers in the welfare branch when I analysed and did my anthropological study of that outfit and two could speak a word of an Aboriginal language. So you, built, you, you bend to our will. So Wayne, your question is quite right. The assimilationist thrust is still there. And when you look, and even just take sport as a litmus, Ken Edwards in Queensland has done fantastic research and produced written programs and records of 3,000 pre-white settlement games played by Aborigines. But you want to get somewhere, you play AFL. <laughs> and you play rugby league, and you play cricket, and you run, and you box, and okay. Okay, it's a good question, and I'm sorry we don't have a long time to discuss that whole very, very serious issue. The Aboriginal appearance is almost like yesterday, 1960 plus. It occurs in very often in clusters. It occurs amongst family members. It doesn't necessarily occur where there's a history of suicide in the family. It doesn't necessarily occur where there's been domestic violence in the family and so on. I've talked to literally hundreds of kids who've survived their suicide attempts and the 
only common theme that I can get out of the answers, such as they are, and this is playing pool with these kids in country towns and drinking beer with them or whatever, why, why, why do you feel this way? Well, life is so shitty down here, I'm going to try it up there. And I say, well, do you know? And they say, well, Professor, do you know? No, of course I don't. Yeah. Okay, the contagion cluster has never been fully explored. We don't understand it. We don't fathom it. It doesn't have the pattern that you find in white middle class or semi-middle class or even a lower middle class urbanized families. The factors that are at work in the work that I did, I studied Aboriginal communities in the ACT in New South Wales and um, in then the Maori in New Zealand and then again in, in Canada in Nunavut amongst the Inuit people. There is no serious record of depression or mental illness or mental issues associated with those kids' <coughs> suicide. The Canadian experience is very interesting. A lot of it is now emerging as broken relationships. The boyfriend leaves or the girlfriend leaves and boom, bang. Um, what do you do? One of the things, and Aboriginal friends and elders in this room will certainly agree with me on this, there was a time when there was always what in boxing is called your second who's in the ring, your mentor who says you've had enough, you've got cut eyes, you shouldn't continue, we throw in the towel, we stop the fight. There are very few Aboriginal mentors or seconds left around who are there to intercede when things start going wrong. And this is a very serious problem in a lot of Aboriginal communities. That responsibility, which often devolved on the grandparents, the grandparents are burnt out and they're tired. They're not there because the parents are not there or perhaps have never been there in many instances. But there are no mentors left. So your question is, does an Aboriginal kid at Balgo go to the only telephone booth for 500 kilometres and phone a hotline? No, he doesn't. Does he phone your clinic? No, he doesn't. Will he ever? No. The question is, how do you go out to that community? How do you find and resurrect the, the, the boxing seconds or the mentors to be there? And I don't think it's all that difficult. One of the things I think we need more than anything else, and I'll just end with this, every Aboriginal community I've ever visited, and I hope this rings a bell with you in your practice, a lot of Aboriginal kids live in a total cycle of grief. Every week they attend a funeral or two funerals. Now, there are no grief counsellors, nor are there any mentors who can act as the equivalent of grief counsellors. You don't have to do a four-year honours degree in psychology to be a grief counsellor. And my point is you can train local people to be the equivalent of a grief counsellor, to be there to try and interrupt that constant, I, we, we were in Cobar, I think we went to two funerals in a week. You go to Walgard, you go to Wilcannia, two, three funerals a week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.